So let's get to it. Our opening keynote speaker is Dr. Karen Miga, who is an assistant research scientist at the UC Santa Cruz Genomics Institute. In 2018, she co-founded the Telomere to Telomere Consortium, an open community-based effort to generate the first complete assembly of a human genome. Additionally, Dr. Miga is the director of the Data Production Center for the Human Pan Genome Reference Consortium. Central to Dr. Miga's research program is the emphasis on satellite DNA biology and the use of long read and new genome technologies to construct high quality genetic and epigenetic maps of human centromeric and pericentromeric regions. Karen, thank you and welcome. Great, thanks so much for the invitation. This is gonna be a great day. Um, like in the introduction, I'm Karen Miga from UC Santa Cruz and I'm going to present today on behalf of the Telomere to Telomere Consortium. So I'll just quickly say the current human reference genome has been foundational for genetics and genomics. However, we all know that it is incomplete. And these incomplete regions are biologically important for how we understand chromosome biology and function. These gaps are roughly 5% of our genome, include centromeres or the regions where our chromosomes are um, designed to be um, informed for segregation of our chromosomes during cell division, as well as telomeres, segmentally duplicated genes, and tandem gene arrays. Well, I'm showing you one key example here on chromosome nine to give you kind of an emphasis of the scope of this problem, where the centromeric regions in the pericentromeric satellites can be greater than 10 megabases, and flanking on either side, which I'm showing you in green, are the segmentally duplicated regions, which on their own extend for megabases. And I also wanted to use this slide to demonstrate that these highly repetitive regions, although missing in our singular human reference genome, can be highly polymorphic or variant in the population. Uh, these can often be seen from space as seen here for chromosome nine for allele one and allele two. So why has it taken so long? I think we all know the answer to this. Um, these regions are highly repetitive. And so just the sequencing technology and the assembly and all of the things that will be covered in this um, innovative workshop um, is really the call to arms to how we could finish this. So this was also what summoned the organization of the consortium. Um, here I'm showing Adam Philippi and myself. We both co-led this effort. Um, we is a completely open community-based effort to complete an assembly of a human genome. The cell line that we're choosing to use um, is a complete hydatiform mole. This particular cell line is special in the sense that it represents a an accident that happens early in fertilization, where you have a complete loss of maternal chromosomes. And when the paternal sperm comes in or the genome, it goes through a round of duplication. So although you have a normal karyotype of 46 chromosomes, it's effectively haploid because all the chromosomes are identical. And this is really useful for resolving some of these more complicated or um, repeat structures that may differ between homologous chromosomes. Here, you, you bypass that assembly challenge. So it makes it a lot more straightforward to, to go forward and try to complete the genome. And using this particular genome, um, we have now issued a kitchen sink approach of all the long read technologies. Um, here I'm just sharing kind of uh, the information that we currently have on our GitHub page. Um, it, this is completely open. Anyone can go and, and reference this work. Our primary challenge was to issue a telomere to telomere assembly of complete chromosomes. Here I'm showing you what that means. Essentially, it is a single contig that extends from the P-arm telomere to the Q-arm telomere. So you have complete sequence representation, but also there's an emphasis here on a consistent base quality from telomere to telomere. And as I introduced at the beginning, this is really a challenge of repeat assembly, um, where um, we're trying to traverse these really long, sometimes hundreds of kilobases all the way to megabases length repeats. And the way this can be thought about is that you're trying to find reads that can adequately anchor into unique sequence in order to guide this type of assembly process. One natural way to think about this is to use um, a sequence type called ultralong. This is from the Nanopore platform, where you now have reads that can span hundreds of kilobases and anchor uniquely outside of these tandem repeats. Um, this type of technology was championed back in 2018, um, largely from Nick Lohman, Matt Luce and Josh Quick's protocol to issue these ultra long sequences initially on the MinION. Um, as we'll hear about today, this has been um, really advanced with technologies now to where we're seeing real progress in the Promethean. This also was demonstrated to have biological consequences, not only in the paper um, that issued the whole human genome, but also by using these ultra longs to close the first human centromere. 
Additionally, we have a second type of sequence type. This is the high fidelity or hi-fi reads from PacBio. Um, these are Sanger-like quality reads where we can now use a different type of variant which falls within the repeats themselves. So I'm showing you as in red, where now you can begin to um, confidently map reads to these single nucleotide repeats and also anchor across. So this circular consensus sequencing has been really important for our team. Um, with PacBio HiFi, we're finding this is about 20 KB reads. We were able to get um, extremely high quality. The pros here are quite obvious in the, in the outstanding accuracy and the improved resolution of repeats that we're seeing. The cons, of course, is that unlike the ultra long, we have a limited read length. Now, our team has been um, working on both of these technologies to issue whole genome assemblies from CHM13. Here in this slide, I'm going to try to show you are the results from these independent data sets demonstrating that they're complementary technologies um, and they result in high in 50s. However, the breaks in the context tend to be different. So we can use um, both of these technologies together to hopefully repair and, and complete the human genome. This is quite notable where some technologies um, for example, are completing entire chromosomes, notably on chromosome five, you can see the HIFI is completing both arms um, versus chromosome 18, where it seems like they're performing the same and other chromosomes such as chromosome 16, where it seems like we're still breaking into a number of contexts in one versus the other. So we took a step back and we had a virtual workshop this summer where we decided to integrate these types of data sets with the, the high prize on finishing the human genome and issuing our first um, T to T release of as many um, finished T to T chromosomes as possible. This is largely crediting um, some of the innovation that was brought to the team by Sergey Nook. Um, and this, we're taking a graph first approach. Um, in this case, there's a HiFi string graph this is utilizing some of the um, technology that came out of the High Canoe paper, where there's a homopolymer compression, read cleaning and correction, and string graph from long perfect overlaps. We take a Hamiltonian walk for the easy tangles, and we use Nanopore, the ultra long reads that I introduced for the hard tangles. And then we use the Hi Fi for consensus and decompression. What we end up with is a really um, wonderful graph that I'm hoping you can appreciate here with most of the chromosomes represented um, in very long contiguous um, assemblies. From this, I wanna make three clear points here. From this initial reconstruction, what we were able to do is have T to T chromosome candidates for five different chromosomes. Chromosome 11 is one that I'm showing here. Um, however, there were complex tangles that still remained. Um, two key examples, of course, would be the human satellites, two and three. I'm showing one example on chromosome nine, as well as the acrocentrics. However, importantly, we didn't find a lot of these long distant links or sequences that were identical between the different chromosomes. Um, apart from the distant link that I'm showing on chromosome nine, where there's a duplication, we do find it there. And the acrocentrics are the RDNAs um, that link the acrocentric chromosomes together. But other than that, the graph um, was quite impressive. There's also a tour de force here, um, including the heroic effort of Sergey Koron, who also is gonna be part of the program today, um, to go through and resolve some of these remaining um, issues in the graph. But however, this was kind of where we started when we, um, when we worked through our, our more recent release. So this is very much a work in progress. As I introduced on the previous slide, there are still complex repeat structures that um, our team is working on, but perhaps the one that is still removed from our release are the RDNAs. Um, this is crediting Adam Philippi and Jen Gurton, who have been um, leading this working group effort. And here I'm trying to show you the different chromosomes and how they um, come together. And you can see these chromosome specific RDNA clusters and the recent recombinations due to the distant um, distal junctions shown in this particular figure. So now that you have an assembly prediction, we've had um, exhaustive teams come through and try to do validation and curation to demonstrate that this is a highly accurate sequence map. Right now we're estimating error one in every one to 10 megabases and only a couple of hundred sites are flagged per chromosome. Um, this is largely crediting our evaluation and curation team. And we're also looking for accurate alignments and variant calling to see if we can flag um, any of these particular errors. This has been taking two different um, tools that I wanted to emphasize in this particular slide, which is mapping with WinOMAP2. This is um, largely crediting Jane et al.'s papers um, below and using sniffles to call variants as well as marker assisted mapping um, to where we can now use, this is uh, first uh, um, introduced in our nature paper for T2TX, 
where we find single copy k-mers um, throughout all of the chromosomes. We then align reads and then filter reads based on their overlap with these unique markers. And that allows us to analyze um, these very repetitive regions for consistency with our mapping alignments. Here I'm trying to show you the marker density as well as all of these different alignments with long read tools. And what I hope you can appreciate from the slide is that we see this really nice smooth alignment um, across the chromosomes. However, where we are finding um, inconsistencies perhaps in the alignments and the, the uh, decrease in marker density is in the centromeric regions. And so this is where our SENSAT team that I've been leading through the TLMA to TLMA group has really stepped up to use some specialized tools to try to closely evaluate the quality of these particular sites. Here I'm trying to show you all of the centromeric regions for the CHM13 genome. Um, I hope your eyes can appreciate that there's a red or this is the alpha satellite. This is the primary centromeric sequence in all human um, centromeres, as well as the blue, which this is the larger human satellites um, that we're finding on the pericentromeric regions of a subset of chromosomes. The satellite assemblies are high quality and they're structurally correct. Um, this is mainly using a lot of the tandem tools that have been issued. Um, previously looking at tandem mapper and tandem quast, where we're able to flag putative errors and then work with the assembly team and or polishing team um, to correct these particular area and previous versions, as well as um, working with automated assembly strategies to find consistency with predictions, such as I'm showing you here for centrifly on chromosome six. Additionally, we've been using PCR-free Illumina-based um, comparisons where we can now predict the length of the array using this orthogonal um, copy number estimate with the actual length of the array that we're finding in our assemblies, and we find that they're highly concordant. We've also teamed up with Jennifer Gurton to demonstrate with digital droplet PCR that we can estimate the size of the arrays um, to be concordant with what we're finding in the actual assembly as well. So we've now issued on in September a complete sequence of a human genome. Of course, the asterisk is there because we still are working through the RDNA arrays. Um, but I just wanted to share kind of a, an overview of what's currently available to the community. This T to T CHM13 without these um, small header het sites that we're finding contain 23 different chromosomes. Um, no Y, we have no unlocalized, no unplaced. And this represents um, 3.05 gigabases of sequence of which 100 to 190 megabases or three to six percent of new sequences are being estimated now relative to our previous genome assembly. So now the fun part, right? It's how do we gain new insight into genome biology and structure? And as I introduced at the beginning, some of the largest gaps in the human genomes happen to fall in these centromeric regions. So I'm going to use that as one of our examples where you have these long, often multi-megabase arrays of satellite DNAs that are interspersed with um, segmental duplications, which contain paralogous genes, transposable elements. So essentially, these are large ecosystems of repeats. Once again, I'm going to bring this particular slide up to demonstrate that the vast majority of human centromeric regions are defined by these larger satellite arrays. Um, alpha satellite and the classical human satellites, two or three, are the predominant centromeric satellite arrays, and they represent 5.76 of what we're seeing in the CHM13 genome. Here on chromosome one, for example, these particular satellite arrays are huge. Um, we're looking at numbers like 13 megabases in length for just the human satellite alone. Now, these, most of these regions have never been seen before, so we've organized a team of experts to go through and begin to um, characterize and annotate these particular arrays. Here, I'm just showing you um, some of our annotation for the superchromosomal families, as well as our single mo motifs for centromere binding proteins, as we start to begin to annotate and bring some um, new language into how we're going to characterize these particular regions. Also, we've teamed up with Nick Altimos, who was one of the early um, pioneers on how to characterize human satellite DNAs using sequence-based data to sets. And here we're able to show that we're able to span arrays as large as 27 megabases. And although the repeats differ in sequence and structure between the arrays, um, they really follow what we had expected using subfamily um, characterizations in the past. And also there's been a lot of interest in discovering candidate genes and coding regions that exist in the centromeric regions um, that had not been part of HG38 in the past. This is work that's largely been led by our gene annotation team. This is crediting Mark Deakins, as well as using our orthogonal um, expression and proseq data to, to go up and follow up on these particular findings. And that's been led by Rachel O'Neill's laboratory, notably Savannah Hoyt. 
And so here I'm demonstrating that we have a link RNA in chromosome one, as well as another type of gene prediction um, here. So these are things that we're very interested in following up on. So how do we begin to use these maps to study epigenetic regulation? As I introduced in the beginning of my talk, um, a lot of the mapping techniques have been conscience of repeats. And one in particular has been identifying all the positions of these unique markers or marker-assisted mapping. And this is largely crediting the work of Arangri and, and Anne McCartney. And using these types of um, repeat-aware mapping, um, we can now look at the ultra-long nanopore reads and begin to study methylation. And this is crediting Ariel Gershman from Johns Hopkins University, who's working in Winston Temps lab. Now, as we perhaps all know, the nanopore sequencing directly probes the chemical structure of the molecules. Um, it does this with incredible sensitivity. The long reads have a real advantage here because unlike our previous attempts to study methylation, these actually are long enough to confidently map and, and stretch over sometimes completely these long tandem repeats that exist in the genome. And each one of these reads provides a, a readout of CPG methylation. Therefore, we're able to probe epigenetic heterogeneity of the sample. So here I'm trying to show you just some consistencies and, and expectations in the sense if you're looking over a transposable element, we would perhaps expect it to be methylated. This is being shown by the red lollipops, as well as the heat map I'm showing below where red um, illustrates methylated CPGs and blue is the unmethylated. However, perhaps if you were in a gene-based region, you would expect the site of transcription to be unmethylated, and that's the blue band that you can see at the beginning of the gene. When we first started this work, we were studying the X chromosome, and we were finding that it matching expectations in the literature, if you were to go to the pseudo-autosomal region, which is shared between the X and the Y chromosome as a pairing site, um, it's expected to be hypomethylated. And indeed, we did find that trend um, as we looked across the X chromosome. If we started to look over more complicated sites, like the DXZ4, which is a large tandem repeat, that had been previously characterized as to uh, be the site or the division between two large superdomains separated, um, or a TAD domain. We can then begin to look at this particular repeat, and we reported finding these very interesting oscillating patterns of, of hypermethylated and methylated sequences with a strict drop-off um, right when you get to the end of the array. And it was really fun working with Ariel because she was able to also identify that this drop-off that we were noticing happened to have a genomic feature in the inversion of the array. And perhaps as a sensory biologist, one of the most interesting things was finding this large hypomethylated region in the middle of the centromeric array that we had never seen before um, that was roughly estimated around 60 kb. And now that we have all of these centromeric arrays at high quality, we've gone through and begun to study this comprehensively. Here I'm showing a panel of different centromeric arrays where we're finding this characteristic dip across all of what we're considering the live arrays or the arrays that are typically bound to centromere proteins. Now, once we have these unmethylated regions in the X centromeric array, it's natural to question what's going on, what's driving this unique methylation signature. Um, there, there's a natural idea here that perhaps the centromeric arrays themselves are broken into multiple epigenetic um, sites, partly the pericentromeric heterochromatin, which is the purple heterochromatin shown here. And in the middle, there's a centromeric, centromeric chromatin or centromeric core, which contains centromere protein A and H3 interspersed. And so one hypothesis that our team raised was whether or not centromere protein A marks the sites of kinetic core assembly and centromere function. To test this, we teamed up with Gina Caldas from Abby Dernberg's group at UC Berkeley to see if we could integrate cut and run experiments. This also took into account a different type of mapping um, thought process where we now needed to think about how we were going to integrate Illumina paired in data. So for those of you who are not familiar with cut and run, essentially what we're trying to do is localize an antibody um, through permeabilized cells. In this case, we're using the centromere protein A antibody because that's specific to the centromeric regions in our hypothesis. Um, these particular antibodies um, have an MNase to them, so therefore you can cut out the sequence of interest. You can um, collect these nucleosome complexes, they diffuse out, extract DNA, and generate an Illumina sequence library, which we can then map to our version one assembly. Um, in doing this, we did find a, a very nice trend where we're seeing this type of a pileup or enrichment um, over the SEMPA in regards to the, the hypomethylated regions that are methylated. And I just wanted to also bring credit to this recent work by Glennis Logston, where they found a similar result when looking at chromosome 8. 
So we go through, of course, all of the different centromeric regions, and this is a trend that we're seeing over and over and over again. And now we're starting to actually um, start to develop more tools to where we can precisely map these regions. So, and working with our T2T -T team, we're now using this unique marker-assisted mapping to see if we can anchor and confidently study within centromeric regions for the first time um, these types of alumina data sets. In addition, we've been looking at RNA transcripts. Um, here I'm showing you work from Savannah Hoyt, where we were also once again using Illumina ProSeq data. And just briefly, um, we're able to show that 54% of the send repeats are transcribed. However, while the satellites make up 77% or the largest component of this particular centromeric region, they do not appear to be highly transcribed. They only account for 5%. Mainly what we're finding when we're reporting this type of um, repeat transcription are the TEs. And so this has been a really healthy effort by our team to try to dig into this further and understand how these particular regions are being regulated. And so I really wanted to end my talk by saying this is a new era for T2T genomics. This is a really exciting time and all of our resources are open. So we hope that um, folks will join us um, as we start to close the human genome. And this is also a celebration of collaborative and open science. Um, this is just a few of the highlight, a few of our team members that have been really involved with our virtual workshop over the summer and I'll take any questions. Perfect. Thank you, Karen. We have a question here in the Q&A box. And just a reminder for everyone, if you'd like to ask a question of anyone at any time, you can go into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen and type your question there, and we will get it answered uh, as long as time allows. Uh, the question here, I'll just read it for everyone, is how do telomere lengths in your T2T -T studies compare to telomere lengths measured by the golden standard Q fish methods most commonly used? I'm going to say that that has not been fully finished by our team yet. We have a telomere, we have a telomere working group um, that's specifically trying to look at this question. However, I want to emphasize that this is a very strange cell line and that it's it's not a, a normal cell line. It's been immortalized, um, and so there is an expectation here that there will not be biological meaningful information by studying this particular cell line's telomere length. Okay, great. Another question just popped up. Um, how does proportion of transposable elements compare? So this also is also a, a very big um, focus of led by Rachel O'Neill's group to study the transposable elements in particular. And so we're trying to, or I could give her credit, she is breaking these particular transposable families um, into their evolutionary phylogenetics and studying how, how they're being expressed at the moment. So those data are not ready um, to share yet, but stay tuned. Um, that should be released soon. Okay, great. Uh, hi, Karen. This is this is Jeff at Circulomics. Uh, I have a I have a quick question here. Um, so you know, as a kind of a tools developer, um, we work on kind of improving sequencing methods. And so you talk about the cell line being kind of a an odd odd cell line. So how how difficult is it to extend the current tools to kind of a diploid T to T? Um, and kind of what, what will be needed either on maybe the bioinformatics side or the sequencing side um, in order to actually achieve that? Well, this is a great interest of the Human Pan Genome Reference Consortium. We actually have a whole working group dedicated to a diploid T to T. And this has also been um, kind of a merger with the T2T um, consortium. So this is very much on our radar. So just to kind of let you know that we have started to work toward a roadmap to this. I don't think anyone knows the roadmap yet. I do think, of course, um, there are some hunches here that using uh, an individual who perhaps has uh, more diversity to allow for this type of phased long read strategy seems like a really natural win here. I think there's been a lot of um, interest in integrating data sets such as HiC where um, that information can help with the partitioning as well. Um, I think that what we've been relying on so far is TRIO-based information. That's where we're finding our best assemblies. So there's an emphasis um, on that particular aspect of kind of where the, the resource needs to be um, utilized. I think as far as the, the technologies that are currently on the radar, it would be um, ultra long as well as this really important hi-fi um, for contigging and as well as um, high C and alumina based data sets to help improve phasing. And I want to also answer quickly that even if one were to generate a telomere to telomere diploid phased chromosome, 
I, we have insufficient tools right now to do comprehensive evaluation, I think. Uh, I think that there's um, quite a lot of work perhaps or, or dedicated effort that could be done at, minimally at the satellites where I think quite deeply, where we just don't have the high throughput tools yet to evaluate how correct those particular assemblies are and how well they're being phased. And so it's, it's difficult at the moment, even if we did have the tools to make the assembly, um, to actually go through and do the correct exhaustive evaluation. Okay, thanks. Okay, great. Thanks, Jeff. <clears throat> we have another question um, just put in the chat. And just uh, again, a reminder, it'd be great to um, get questions in the Q&A box. I see one more has popped up that we may have touched on, but uh, just the one in the chat is, uh, was cut and run selected because of the improved signal to noise? Question mark. I was also thinking chipsy could be advantageous since you could sequence longer chip DNA that maybe may align better to the unique anchor points. Well, cut and run, we're able to get um, 150 paired in base. I, I don't think the limitation there has been on read length for our team. Um, I will say that the um, in chip is something that we hope to incorporate eventually. The reason why cut and run was so exciting for our team was that it didn't require the, the cell numbers. Um, CHM13 is not the easiest cell to grow. Um, so having lower numbers to begin the experiment was actually advantageous for us to branch out and do numerous um, cut and run experiments if we needed to to advance our portfolio. But we, we absolutely are expanding um, on ChipSeq as well. Perfect, thank you. And I think you just touched on this last question, uh, but I'll just read it again anyway, just for clarity, can the same assembly method work on normal diploid genome? So I, I think that my my understanding is that this particular conservative graph really works well for haploid chromosomes and that it may not be the best method of choice for a diploid um, chromosome as it is. However, I think some of the concepts that are being introduced here and in, in the idea of using the HiFi um, as a graph, and this is largely celebrating work from HiFi ASM, um, as well as work um, from the HPRC effort, um, we're starting to see that using the HiFi for contigging is really a natural first step. And, and that's something I think that's shared between this effort and moving into a diploid. Um, next approach is kind of this focus on a graph using HiFi and then building from that and using the ultra long data that we've been using um, to resolve some of the trickier regions for the T to T, I think will also fall in naturally into place when we start talking about diploids as well. So a lot of the tooling and development work there, I think um, has a natural transition um, as we start to move into diploids. Perfect, thank you, Karen. Thank Give, you. Uh, just a couple of seconds for any more questions that come through the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Oh, I have one a question for you, Karen, um, if it's okay. Uh, just curious how interested you guys are in directed sequencing using uh, some of the CRISPR type technologies for some of your problem areas? I think all of us in the community would love to have T to T chromosomes into production. And if, and a lot of that production effort means that we have to drop the price tag perhaps a lot. So there is a natural opportunity to consider targeted enrichment of these more difficult regions with long reads if one wanted to um, pull that into a model of how one could do this. I think that um, it, it may not be the first go-to for trying to, to attack the diploid problem. However, I think it's a natural parallel study um, that would be very useful for future efforts to try to make this um, perhaps more cost-effective, uh, especially even if you're not trying to reach T to T assemblies, but just trying to really dig into the biology of these more rep repetitive regions, um, it might actually be useful to have this type of targeted strategy in place. <laughs> 